Hey everybody, welcome back for another Unraid video. Today we're going to look at how to mount remote file systems without a VPN using SSHFS, and alternatively using a tool for FTP servers called curl FTPFS. I know what some of you might be thinking, why in the world would I need to do any of this? And in some small part that may be true. It's certainly true that there are other tools that may be able to accomplish these same feats, like LFTP for example, but not as easily or maybe in the same way. So let's take a look and discuss one hypothetical use case where having a remote file system mounted onto our local system would be very convenient. Suppose I've got a basic file server in a remote location. I've already set up and pushed my SSH keys to the remote system, per my previous video, and I want to run an rsync backup of a local share to my remote share. If I have a VPN in place, I can easily mount a remote share using the unassigned devices plugin. But if I don't have a VPN in place, I can still run this backup using SSHFS or curlFTPFS to sync local files to a remote share. Or as another quick example, let's say I have a seed box that doesn't support SMB mounts even with a VPN connection. It would still be nice to be able to save or move files around without having to use a tool like FileZilla for simple tasks. There are some nuances we'll get into later in the video between SSHFS and curlFTPFS. But if it sounds like something you're interested in, then stick around and let's get started. Alright, so the first one we're going to look at is SSHFS. It's the easiest to install and all we have to do is use the NerdPack plugin which can be found here in Community Applications. So if you don't have that, do a search for that. I've already got it. Right here you'll see the install button. Once you get that installed, let's head over to our settings. It can also be found here on, under the settings tab. And then let's do a search for SSH. And you'll see it right there, SSHFS. So I'm gonna come down here, toggle that to install and hit apply. And let that pull down real quick. Once that's done, we need to create a share in our array that we wanna mount the remote share into. Keep in mind, this won't actually take up space in our array. So let's go ahead and make this a cache share if you have it. I'm gonna switch over here to the shares tab and hit add share. Share name, I'm just gonna call mine Seedbox because I'm actually going to be mounting a Seedbox share. So uh, I do suggest that you go ahead and use a, a cache pool, but I don't think it should matter too much. But again, um, it's not gonna be using up any drive space. So this is all happening on the remote server itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit add share. And done. Now that we have a mount location ready, let's quickly examine the syntax of SSHFS before we jump to the terminal. Here we've got the command itself followed by your remote server's username, at, and then the host address, then a colon, and the directory path that we want to mount, space, then our local mount point path, space, and then our options. However, the options can also be inserted directly after starting the command right here and before the server info, and this is my preferred method. Now, if you scroll down below and look, you're gonna see an extensive list of options available. I'm only gonna be using a few of these in today's video, but feel free to browse through these. I'll leave a link below in case you see any that may benefit your particular goals or environment, some of which can affect performance positively or negatively. Now let's switch to a terminal window here and I'll enter the command for us to go over. So here's the SSHFS command, the hyphen O option flag, the different arguments separated by commas, the username and address of the remote server, the path of the remote server we're planning to mount, and lastly the local mount point. 
So essentially, this merges the two file paths. Let's take a quick look at the arguments. No compression disables the built-in compression that SSH uses by default, which can actually speed up the connection. Server Alive Interval forces the connection to stay alive even if you have no activity. If the connection hangs, the reconnect option can ensure that it's re-established as soon as possible, and allow other can help mitigate permissions issues between different users on local and remote systems. So I'm gonna fill in my username, address, and path, and then go ahead and connect. On this machine, I don't have my SSH keys shared to the remote server, so it's gonna ask for a password once I connect. Now we can navigate to the path that we just mounted by typing cd command slash mnt slash user slash seedbox. And once there, we can hit ls to list the files and directories. And there we go. So just to confirm that it's working, if I navigate into, say, the movies folder and hit ls, I can see a whole list of movies that I've got in there. So let's back out of that. Clear the screen. Now let's check and make sure that we're actually able to write. So to do that, let's type the make directory command and we'll just call this folder test. And now if we list the folders again, we can see our test file right there. Now to disconnect, all we have to type is umount and then the path of the local mount point, which in my case is mnt slash user slash seedbox. If this happens on your end, then type umount hyphen f l and then the path again, mnt user seedbox. The fl is a force and L is for lazy mount. So now if I list again, you can see cannot open directory transport endpoint is not connected. Successfully disconnected. Now in the second half of the video, we're gonna look at curl FTPFS. SSH connections are great for managing and navigating files and folders or uploading and downloading smaller documents. But if you're transferring large files on a regular basis, you'll quickly notice the limitations of an SSH connection speed due to its encryption. So if you don't plan on transferring sensitive data and don't mind reduced security over an FTP connection, then curl FTPFS may be more the tool for you. The biggest drawback is going to be the installation is not quite as easy as SSHFS was. But we're going to walk through that step by step. So first, we need a place to download the package into. I'll include the link below for you to copy and paste at the time of this recording. However, if you're watching this in the future and the link is broken, just Google a new download link and copy paste that in its place. I'd recommend downloading this to a cache share. In my case, I already have a folder set up called Documents. So I'm going to navigate to the download location, which is cd slash mnt user documents, and now type make directory command curl ftpfs then navigate inside that folder and type wget and then paste the link in and hit enter now let's list the files there we can see our download next thing we need to do is extract that by typing tar capital J XVF. Then you can just type curl star dot T X Z. Now, if we list those files again, then we can remove the dot T X Z file. RM star dot T X list files again to confirm and we're in good shape so now let's go ahead and clear our screen then we want to navigate inside that USR folder by typing CD USR and make sure not to include the slash here otherwise it'll take you to your 
system USR folder. Let's list those files. Navigate to CD slash BIN. List again. And there's the executable curl FTPFS file. So now what we want to do is create a symlink from this to our actual user bin folder. And to do that, we're going to type ln hyphen s and the absolute path of the directory plus the file name, which in my case is mnt slash user slash documents slash curl ftp fs slash usr slash bin slash curl ftp fs then a space and then the path to the system user bin folder plus the name of the link which is slash usr slash bin slash curl ftp fs then hit enter, and once that's done, let's navigate to a different directory and confirm that it's working system-wide. So I'll just go to uh, cd slash mnt slash user and type curl ftpfs hyphen h. The output should be the list of options, just like this. So now that we have all that set up correctly, we want this to persist after a reboot. So let's make an entry to the go file. But first, to save ourselves some typing, let's scroll up and copy and paste the symlink entry above, just like so. so Command C on the keyboard, copy that, then scroll back down and type nano slash boot slash config slash go and hit enter. Then at the bottom, if you want to add a brief description, you can. Uh, to do that, just type pound curl ftpfs install. You can see above where I've made the entries before for ffmpeg, and I didn't put a description there. But um, on this one, just hit command V to paste that in. Then hit control O and enter to save. Control X to exit. At this point, we're ready to connect to our FTP server, so let's clear the screen and examine the command. We've got the initial command followed by the V flag for verbose so we can watch what happens while we connect, the O flag for our options followed by the list of arguments. I should point out that this command is very specific for my connection. For example, the first argument here is for SSL, which is a requirement from my Seedbox provider. Not all servers that you connect to may require this, or in some cases, a server may have stricter requirements. This is followed up by no verify peer and no verify host name. I found that I had some issues with the SSL if I didn't use these. Allow other is the same argument we used earlier with SSHFS, but you may notice we didn't use the reconnect argument. Probably should have mentioned this earlier, but one of the great things about this method is it automatically reconnects if the connection times out. And lastly, and uniquely, the username and password are entered as an argument. So if you're connecting to a server that doesn't require authentication, you may not need these. And then it's followed by either the server IP address or hostname, colon, and the remote path we wish to mount. Then it finishes up with our local mount point FTP connection requirements can vary somewhat, so this is again why I wanted to include the verbose option. This way it can help you diagnose any connection errors or requirements for your specific environment. If you do have issues connecting in this way, take the errors you get and try entering them into Google and see what you find. There's a ton of information online with often easy resolutions. It took me a little trial and error to get mine fine-tuned. But hopefully this will work for you, or at least get you pointed in the right direction. Now I'm going to enter my information here, and then let's take a look at the output. Okay, we can see that we've got a successful connection. So I'm going to clear the screen. And I'm just going to navigate a little bit through the directory to make sure everything's working all right. 
Now, if you're already in the directory before you mounted it, like I am here in, in the Seedbox folder, you need to back out of that first for it to load. So I'm just gonna go up one folder and then navigate right back into it. CD, Seedbox. Now, if I hit LS, I can see all my files pop up. Now keep in mind you're working on a remote server, so there's gonna be just a little bit of a delay, but there's our test file that we created earlier, so we can navigate into that. CD test. And just to make sure we have right permission, let's go ahead and make another test file within that. I'm gonna do the make directory command, test two. list the files to make sure it's there and there it is now if you want to unmount the directory it's the same process as it was before so let's back out of this I'm just gonna go back up to mount user and then I'm gonna do U mount and then the full path which is MNT user seed box so now if I navigate to my seed box folder and I hit LS, now there will be nothing in there because I've un successfully unmounted it. Remember, if you do have something running while you're trying to unmount it, to use the F and L flag like this. And then the path that you wanna unmount. The main goal of this video was to showcase the basics of these tools in a way that will allow you to tweak and refine them to suit your needs. They can be used for mounting shares to VMs, Docker containers, backup scripts, general file management, and any number of other things. Feel free to share in the comments which one you end up using and why, and any useful tips for other users that might be helpful. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe, and until next time, have a great day.